Okay, good evening, uh, happy Sabbath, and we're going to begin our study with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you um, as we are on the edges of the Sabbath. Uh, we invite your presence, and we ask for your blessing that you promised to be upon this day as we come together to study your word. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts and that we can see clearly um, our sins and our need of you. We, Lord, the subject tonight is something that is really um, beyond our understanding without your Holy Spirit to teach us. We need your hearts and to show us what it is that um, has hindered our relationship with you. We need to have the conviction of your Holy Spirit of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. We need to understand what this means, not just intellectually, <clears throat> but in our experience as we walk with you day by day. We pray for each other. We know, Lord, that um, we all face in our lives. And I just pray, Lord, that as we look at these things, that we can encourage one another as we discuss and study your word. Be with us now, we pray and ask. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, good evening, everyone. Now, uh, this, these are the notes that were done by Leona. She did this presentation on August 6th. So um, we're looking at something that happened, I guess that would be five weeks ago, that she did this presentation. And, and that was when um, I did my first presentation. So that was five weeks ago, I think. I don't know. It seems like, doesn't seem like it was that long ago. Um, let me see, because this is presentation number, so it couldn't have been five weeks ago, but uh, I guess, no, it wasn't. So, so I'm not sure why it has August 6th. Did she do this presentation on August 6th? That's what it says. Yes. Okay, so what happened on... So on August 6th, hmm, I always thought it was she had done it in connection with my first presentation, but I guess not. Hmm, okay. I remember things wrong sometimes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, somebody can check when, because this would have been recorded and put on their uh, YouTube page. So I just want to confirm. Um, yeah, so it was, if it was August 6th. Hmm. Okay. Must be. So anyway, we're, we're looking at this study here. Now, um, the only does a good job of putting together a number of Spirit of Prophecy statements. Um, the first one here is uh, the cleansing of the soul from sin includes the gifts of forgiveness, justification, sanctification, and the inward cleansing of the heart is shown by the outward cleansing of the life. Now, one of the things that we run into as we we look at this topic is um, this, this is something that many of us have been exposed to some of us all of our lives dealing with some of these words and and Aran and I were having a little bit of a discussion before this study regarding how words are often redefined or given different meanings so instead of the enemy um, 
laying everything out and communicating so that everything's playing to see often what they do is they work at a truth by redefining the words that we use to explain something and we're having a discussion regarding the, the sinless human nature of Christ um, where that has redefined uh, so 77 years from Hiroshima Angela notes um, is this presentation if it was done on August 6th which I think it must have been so when we read some of these things some of these statements we're, we're really going to have to look at how we understand them and and what Ellen White is saying in context I think it was August 20th it was August 20 she did the presentation that's what's on the video okay so that's what I thought that it was when I did my she have composed it on the 6th though sorry could she have composed it on the 6th yeah so she must have written okay. it on the 6th unless she did like two presentations in this or maybe she was going to do it two weeks earlier I don't know uh, but anyway it's interesting she has that date August 6th because yeah I was pretty sure it was the day after I did my presentation which was the 19th what let's also remember that they don't often get their videos posted online as quickly as you and Iran have been doing yeah it's just that I remember I did my presentation and then she did her presentation I could also look at the emails to confirm that too um, she definitely did present this the day after I'm, I'm like so certain of it I don't think I remembered wrong I sometimes do remember wrong but um, I don't think I did in this case but anyway we can look that up again so um, so some of these things are going to be uh, Leona's statements and some of these things are going to be uh, from the spirit of prophecy itself um, and um, we start here so she's dealing with this idea of the three steps I think that's one of the main uh, points that she's addressing here said the Apostle Paul you know not that the unrighteous know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God and such were some of you but ye are washed but ye are sanctified which ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of God. So when we take the statement washed, sanctified, justified, can we say that's justified, uh, sanctified, and um, so we have this word justified at the end. So we is this the same three steps, but using a different sense of what the word justified means? That's the question I have. Is this the same three steps of sin, righteousness, and judgment, or justification, sanctification, and glorification? Or is this just uh, taking this, uh, just emphasizing it by using different symbols of what it means to be cleansed from sin? Any thoughts on that? I would have to think that it's the latter more than the former. So you think it's going to be just an emphasis? I would take it more as an emphasis, yes. Okay. So what does the word justified mean? The way that that we should be approaching that <clears throat> justification, being in a state of being justified, would mean that we have come to a un, come to an understanding of what sin is, but we don't have the understanding yet of how to have sin eradicated from our lives. Okay. Um, 
Now, so remember, we have this word justified. And, I mean, this, this is a word that we use in Christianity, right? Um, but it's, it's the idea of justification is that a person is rendered, uh, that is, show or regarded as innocent. Right? So it would be a, a court term. Right? At least the, the, Greek, the Greek version of justified. Would we agree with that? But that's what justification is. It's being rendered as in a judgment that is or shown or regarded as just or innocent. Amen. Um, I'm thinking back to when I first received Christ, and that's when I realized I was a sinner and I could only be cleansed of my sins through him. But as for getting sinfulness out of my life, I hadn't the clue. Didn't even dawn on me. I just knew that all my past sins were under the blood of Christ. And I knew right away the Holy Spirit was talking to me. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I when I first gave my life to Christ, even though I'd been a Christian, so to speak, intellectually for a few years, but on August 11th, 1980, that's what I experienced was um, that sense of forgiveness and that peace with God that would come from justification. Right. Now, sanctification, what is sanctified, but you're sanctified, what is that? Process of sin being removed from our lives, dying to self and accepting Christ's cleansing every day. Okay, so we know that that Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. So that, that means to be made holy. And the idea of holiness or sanctification is that something is consecrated or set aside uh, for a holy work that is the work of God, right? So um, something is sanctified that has been uh, not set aside before, and it has to become sanctified so it can be used for for God's purposes. So when we take, think of the word holy, I mean, we just think of, uh, often we think of, you know, something that's holy, it's sacred, um, it's, um, it's not, it's not, it, it's in contrast to something that's earthly, Right, something that's not holy would be the things of this earth. So the idea of sanctification is, um, and the Greek word that's used here, is the idea of making something holy. And so we aren't holy, we are sinners. So when we're sanctified, sanctification is this process of making us holy. Now, what about washed? I mean, obviously, that's that's a term that means to clean things. But how would how would that relate to these words justified and sanctified? I keep thinking of that hymn about washing away my sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? You know, mm -hmm. it's totally Christ. Yeah, so so the word means to wash fully, and that is figuratively have remitted. Um, that is reflexively. That is, we have our sins washed away. So, um, when we think of these words, are they synonymous? Washed, sanctified, and justified. As we look at these definitions of the Greek words. Like, is he saying something different with each of these words? Is the point that I'm making? They're the question I'm asking.
Can we say that these are all three parts of something that is restoring us to God's image, but they're not the same thing? Can we say that? Potentially, yes. Okay. Yeah, so they're not the same thing, you're saying. They're, they're all describing different aspects of that work, correct? That's what you're agreeing with that? I think that's a way of looking at it, yes. Okay. So then Ellen White says, the absence of devotion, piety, and sanctification of the outer man comes through denying Jesus Christ our righteousness. The love of God needs to be constantly cultivated. And that's from Faith and Works, page 15. Now, um, so devotion, what is devotion? Okay. The English word devotion. She talks about devotion. What is she talking about? Is devotion the same as the word sanctified? No. Okay. So, because we have devotion, piety, sanctification. Uh, so, so the word devotion, according to uh, the 1828 Webster's Dictionary, says the state of being dedicated, consecrated, or solemnly set apart for a particular purpose. So it's very similar to the word sanctified, right? Sanctification refers to being set apart for a holy purpose. A devotion uh, can often mean that it's, it's a state of being dedicated, consecrated, right? Now, where did we run into this uh, in our studies in the morning? Morning studies like a couple of months ago. If we look at, let's say, um, uh, where is it here? Well, are you looking back in into judges? Okay. Well, I think even um, before that, when the children of Israel, um, they they used a different word, but it's the same idea, a devoted thing, something that's devoted. Right. So in Leviticus 27, it uses the word devoted. And, and we looked at that earlier. Um, was that today or yesterday? Um, when it talks about a field is devoted. Or notwithstanding no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord uh, of all that he hath, both of man and beast and of the field and of his possession shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. So what, when it's talking about devoted here, it's talking about something that's set apart for the Lord. That is, it's a vow that is vowed. It's a pledge. And now it's devoted. So when we think of the word devotion, what do we normally think of? To something, not of something. Okay, explain what you mean by that. Most of the time when you're looking at devotion, you're looking at how you are devoted to okay. something rather than of something. Right, so I'm devoted to my wife, right? Yes. But we don't think of it as, as the giving of ourselves in, in the idea of devotion. And often we talk about devotions, you know, where we read a statement in the spirit of prophecy, pray, and, and that we call devotions. And, and we talk about things that are devotional. Uh, a lot of people use Ellen White as just devotional literature. Um, but she's the absence of devotion. So this is um, being consecrated is the idea of devotion. 
Now, the word piety, you know, we hear this word, but we don't really necessarily think about what it means. Because we just, we just hear it, and it just kind of goes in one ear and out, out the other. So the word piety, in principle, is a compound of veneration or reverence of the supreme being and love of his character, or veneration accompanied with love, and piety in practice is the exercise of these affections in obedience to his will and devotion to his servants, service. So when we are pious... The idea is that we we are devoted to God, and this this is going to be a type of veneration that's accompanied with love, and its practice is causing us to be obedient to God. So that's what piety is. Now, sanctification we already dealt with. And so you can see these words, in a sense, they're all kind of related, devotion, piety, and sanctification, a, a bit more related than washed, sanctified, and justif justified are. And here Ellen White's going to deal with sanctification of the outer man. So the absence of devotion, piety, and sanctification of the outer man comes through denying Jesus Christ our righteousness. The love of God needs to be constantly cultivated. So she's showing that it's this love of God that comes through the righteousness of Christ that actually makes us a Christian. Um, so she says, while one class pervert the doctrine of justification by faith and neglect to comply with the conditions laid down in the word of God, if ye love me, keep my commandments, there is fully as great an error on the part of those who claim to believe and obey the commandments of God, but who place themselves in opposition to the precious rays of light, new to them, reflected from the cross of Calvary. The first class do not see the wondrous things in the law of God for all who are doers of his word. The others cavile over trivialities and neglect the weightier matters, mercy and love of God. Many have lost much in that they have not opened their eyes of their understanding to discern the wondrous things in the law of God. On the one hand, religionists generally have divorced the law and the gospel, while we have, on the other hand, almost done the same from another standpoint. We have not held up before the people the righteousness of Christ and the full significance of his great plan of redemption. We have left out Christ and his matchless love brought in theories and reasonings, and preached argumentative discourses. Now, what's the context in which Ellen White is talking here? I mean, this is the book Faith and Works, which is a uh, taken from some of her other articles. She didn't write the book as Faith and Works. I'm just going to find out where this is. Anybody know? What what would you think the context here? Because who she's talking about, we have not held up before the people the righteousness of Christ. I think she must be talking often to and about the preachers and and teachers because I I remember some of my classes and they're so it was so dry because there's no experiential relationship with Christ that was being taught. Okay, so what time is this that she's writing this? Anybody know? Okay, this is written in 1888. So what's the context in which she's writing this? Okay. 
falling away from the old truths? Okay, so this is a manuscript. It's May. It's actually written May eighteenth, eighteen ninety. But she's writing in the context of the eighteen eighty eight. Uh, general Conference. So this is after the General Conference, uh, more than a year after, year and a half or so. So she's she's writing about, she's writing to the people who have been um, preaching argumentative discourses. So what was happening prior to 1888? Because this is one of the things we're going to look at, and I know not everybody's really familiar with it. Um, but why why was Jones and Wagner's message rejected by uh, G.I. Butler and others? What was it that they particularly thought the problem was? What was the issue? They felt that Jones and Wagner did not have the experience to be making some of the pronouncements that they were, that their studies were incorrect, and especially that Wagner had been following very closely after his father. Okay, so the particular point was they were doing these argumentative discourses and what point what what verse what part of the scripture what idea was were jones and wagner they were undermining uh one of their arguments does anybody know what that is because there's an argument that was being used and we still see it used sometimes in adventism that jones and wagner disagreed with as in as in which part of the law had been disposed of right so the law in galatians that we are no longer under the law the 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 view of the adventists of that time generally was that we are no longer under the ceremonial law right that's the way they take that that passage we are no longer under the law but under grace now why why would we make that argument what were we trying to do? That was an initial step to join themselves at the outset with some of what the Protestant churches had been led to, especially by the uh, by the Catholic fathers. Right. So, so they're they're making an argument that the law is not done away, it's not nailed to the cross, and that when the Bible says we're no longer under the law, but under grace, they're going to argue, well, that's the ceremonial law, but we're still under the law of the Ten Commandments, the moral law. So they'd make this distinction between the ceremonial law and the moral law. Now, Jones and Wagner came with an argument that's saying that the law in Galatians is referring to the moral law. Now, Ellen White clarifies this, that both the moral law and ceremonial law are tied together, that you can't really separate them out that way. And some people use this as an argument against Jones and Wagner, where Ellen White says that it's both the ceremonial and the moral law. But that's actually in agreement with Jones and Wagner. Their, their main argument was that you can't single out the ceremonial law as being done away and um, that we're not under that because when they look at what under the law means in Galatians they say that it means to be under its condemnation so this is relating to righteousness by faith but you can see here in this statement what what Ellen White is talking about these two different classes right there's this one that just doesn't believe in keeping the commandments, but then you have another class that doesn't look at the love of Christ, doesn't look at the righteousness of Christ. And this is where Adventism was at this time in 1888. 
The church was good at arguing, but it wasn't good at presenting the gospel. It had been it had gone from arguing to debating. Yeah, so they would actually enter into debates they, 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 with other denominations. This is, of course, not uh, the way to win people. Um, but they weren't really interested in truly keeping the commandments because they didn't fully understand the gospel. They had a legal religion. This arguing and debating mm -hmm. is exactly what Uriah Smith wanted to see happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they, and, and if I remember, I read Uriah Smith's book on uh, uh, conditionalism. Um, I can't remember the title of it, but basically the idea of what happens when you die. And I was not very impressed. I mean, I was a new Adventist, but I didn't feel that the way that he wrote the book was was winning it was a very argumentative book it was shooting down the arguments of others intellectually it wasn't really making an appeal uh based upon the scriptures what happens when you die it was it was really just an attack as far as i could see so i was never impressed with uriah smith's writings in that sense that they seem to be at least on those points uh, very argumentative. I mean, it's a little bit different in um, when he's dealing with prophecy, but when he's dealing with doctrine, he seems to be pretty argumentative. Um, but anyway, you can see what's happening here. In 1888, Ellen White is taking this statement from 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 to 11, and she's now going to apply this to uh, the context of, of the 1888 message that the love of God needs to be constantly cultivated. Now, of course, the word love has lost its significance. So it doesn't mean much to people, you know. But but here she's putting in the context of the righteousness of Christ. <clears throat> now, here we're going to deal with uh, some more statements of the, from faith and works. The process of justification. As the penitent sinner, contrite before God, discerns Christ's atonement in his behalf and accepts this atonement as his only hope in this life and the future life, his sins are pardoned. This is justification by faith. Every believing soul is to conform his will entirely to God's will and keep in a state of repentance and contrition exercising faith in the atoning merits of the Redeemer and advancing from strength to strength, from glory to glory. So all of us have experienced this, where we have seen our need of God, at least on some level, and have given our lives to Christ, asking him to help us because we, we've messed things up. And... And yet this is to be our constant experience. That is, we didn't just have it happen to us once, and now we're saved and, and never have to think about it again. We have to experience this constantly. Right? So when she says, uh, every believing soul is to conform his will entirely to God's will and keep in a state of constant repentance and contrition. And this is this if this is not our experience, then we are not being sanctified because this is what sanctification is. Now she says pardon and justification are one and the same thing. Through faith, the believer passes from the position of a rebel, a child of sin, and Satan to the position of a loyal subject of Jesus of Christ Jesus, not because of an inherent goodness, but because Christ receives him as his child by adoption. Now, I mean, people could share some of their experiences on how this happened to them, but I'll, I'll first share, share mine, and I've shared it before, but I had tried to become a Christian. About, about the time I was 13, I started... Um, becoming much more serious about my belief. And so I started to 
try to be a Christian. I tried to be good. But it wasn't until I was 17, so about a period of four years, as I'd continued reading and studying and praying and going through different experiences, that I actually experienced this peace of coming to God. And the illustration to me was the one of darkness and light. So that, that came to my mind as I gave my life to God and asked him to take over from the mess I had made of my life. And of course, God began working in my life at that time. Now, it was, doesn't mean he wasn't working before, but from that point, I could see him actively working. That is, I was seeking to do his will, and the events that happened were clearly um, in God's providence. And I could see that active work of God in my life. And now in seeing that, it didn't make me think that I was good. I didn't see myself as righteous. I saw that God was now, me, him and I were working together, cooperating in the work of making me into Christ's image. And, and that means from my perspective, things weren't going the way that I expected them to go. But I could constantly see that God's hand guided even when I stumbled and fell. God was leading me, that I was on this journey with him, and that has never changed from the time that I gave my heart to him. And it was not the same before. I had not experienced that prior, even though I can look back and see how God led in different things that happened to me. But now once I had given my heart to God, I was working with him because I had become a child by adoption. The sinner receives the forgiveness of his sins because these sins are borne by his substitute and surety. The Lord speaks to his heavenly father saying, this is my child. I reprieve him from the condemnation of death, giving him my life insurance policy, eternal life, because I have taken his place and have suffered for his sins. He is even my beloved son. Thus man, pardoned, and clothed with the beautiful garments of Christ's righteousness, stands faultless before God. Um, we'll read more of this here. But is this what people have experienced in coming to Christ? Um, Can anybody agree with that? Well, that's how I felt. And then I remember walking into St. Vincent de Paul and asking for a Bible. And they gave me this tiny little booklet that had quotations from Paul. And I remember reading Romans 5. And I thought, yes, I'm accepted by God. I have his grace now. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. And we also know, I mean, Catholic, I was, wasn't taught any of that, right? And and you started to feel that you were on this journey with God, that now you had somebody. Yeah, trapped definitely. You. I could hear his voice. Like I would ask for instructions and he taught, taught me a lot. And so we never, we never feel like, well, I've arrived now. Right. Hopefully no one feels that way. But often this is what some people experience when they become a Christian. If they're not truly converted, they can conform to the outside, at least to what they think they can show other people, but they ignore the inside of what happens. And so people can be unconverted and yet join the church. Now I'm going to read this, the rest of this here. It says, The sinner may err, but he is not cast off without mercy. His only hope, however, is repentance towards God, toward God, and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the Father's prerogative to forgive our transgressions and sins because Christ has taken upon himself our guilt and reprieved us, imputing to us his own righteousness. His sacrifice satisfies fully the demand of justice. Now we know there's this imputed righteousness 
and imparted righteousness. So imputed righteousness is something, righteousness that we don't have, that is just given to our account. So we can stand faultless before God. But imparted righteousness is the righteousness that's worked out in the life. It's the way that God changes us. So God doesn't just forgive us for our sins or pardon us, but he actually changes us. He transforms us. Justification is the opposite of condemnation. God's boundless mercy is exercised, exercised toward those who are wholly undeserving. He forgives transgressions and sins for the sake of Jesus, who has become the propitiation or mercy seat for our sins. Through Christ, through faith in Christ, the guilty transgressor is brought into favor with God and into the strong hope of life eternal. So again, we have this verse, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. All right, so she's going to look at this a little bit. Um, but I'm going to skip some of this. And we'll get, look at this section in Faith and Works again. So, so another section from Faith and Works. Now, repentance is associated with faith and is urged in the gospel as essential to salvation. Paul preached repentance. So when we think about repentance, um, is that where we start in the Christian walk? How is repentance connected to justification or being justified? When we have to say that repentance is the action that leads to becoming justified. Okay. So, I mean, I think that's true, um, that we need repentance uh, in order to be justified. But when I think back in my experience, I mean, I saw that I was a sinner prior to my conversion, but I thought that I could change. You know, many times I repented of my sins prior to being converted. That is, I saw that what I had done was wrong, and I wanted to change, and I tried to change. But that repentance wasn't what justified me. So repentance is, is a part of our experience, but it's not the cause of justification. Justification comes from God alone. So when we look at being justified from God, that's something that God does. Repentance is something that, that we do. So we know that there's a cooperation between God and us. But repentance, she says, has in it nothing of the nature of merit, but prepares the heart for the acceptance of Christ as the only Savior, the only hope of a lost sinner. So when a person has a conviction of sin and repents, it is something that prepares the heart. So the action that we do does not justify us. We can't be justified by repenting. And when I think about this in the context of the Catholic Church, um, they see repentance as basically an act of, how would they put that, Angela? How would they see repentance? Oh, God, I'm heartily sorry for having offended you, you know, and so on and so forth. I fear the pains of hell. I mean, I can't recall the whole prayer, but I mean, it got you into a terror. Well, I committed a mortal sin. I'm going to hell. Better run to the priest and confess right away. Receive absolution. So Be wouldn't penance. it be, so repentance, well, they have confession. Confession is one of their, um, what's the word? Um, penance. Well, no, confession, they have these um, 
uh, I can't think of the word. Um, because you got baptism, you have confession, you have sacraments. Uh, sacraments, yes, it's one of the sacraments, right? Going to confession yeah. is a sacrament. Yeah. So, so the sacraments are are based upon merit, are they not? In the Catholic yeah. thing, they're things that you have to do in order to be saved. But salvation comes only from God. Even, even repentance, the idea that we can even repent, comes from God. But it is an action of man. But justification is not an action of man. It's something that God does in justifying the sinner. We can't justify ourselves. So she says, as the sinner looks to the law, his guilt is made plain to him and pressed home to his conscience, and he is condemned. That's the experience I had before I was converted. His only comfort and hope is found in looking to the cross of Calvary. As he ventures upon the promises, taking God at his word, relief and peace come to his soul. He cries, Lord, thou hast promised to save all who come unto thee in the name of thy son. I am lost, helpless, hopeless soul. Lord, save, or I perish. His faith lays hold on Christ, and he is justified before God. So you can see that repentance comes before justification. But while God can be just and yet justify the sinner through the merits of Christ, no man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins or neglecting known duties. And obviously, if a person is going to experience that peace that comes to coming to Christ, that comes from coming to Christ, he will have experienced this conviction of sin and this repentance, and he will see that he needs a Savior. And he's not going to say, God, save me, and let me continue doing the things that I'm doing. You go to Christ because you want to be freed from your sins. But it's also known sins. So when I came to Christ, I knew nothing of the Sabbath. There's lots of things I didn't know um, about obedience to God. So I, I, they weren't known sins. Many things in my character that had to change that I was unaware of. But I was at peace with God, and God was working so that as I went through my life, I would be, again, convicted and repentant. So, so the act of repentance is something that occurs again and again. That is, we can't experience justification without repentance. But it would also be connected with sanctification, would it not? Amen. Oh, it says, in order for man to retain justification, there must be continual obedience through active living faith that works by love and purifies the soul. So often she uses that phrase, works by love and purifies the soul. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we learn as we walk with Christ. Oh, now he's pointing out another sin, another another character flaw I need to overcome. But Lord, I can't do it without your help. And some we of them keep take, calling, keep and some of them take, him, we keep calling. Yeah. And some of them take time. <laughs> no kidding. It's painful. Yeah. There are things in our lives that sometimes those sins are so hidden from us that we we often don't don't even aren't even aware of the motives that we have and why we're struggling with something and and what we see is the sin you know the act the thing that we're we don't seem to have control of in our lives is is just the expression of of what's actually going on deep inside of us so sometimes we we can some people they can have the strength to uh, conform to the law of God outwardly. That is, they can 
fool themselves into thinking that they're converted, that they're obedient. And that, of course, is the worst state to be in, to think you're all right when you are all wrong. It's, it's the worst condition because a person is not able to be saved if he continually justifies his actions. Um, so the uh, verse nine twenty it says, "If I justify myself, mine own mouth will condemn me. If mm -hmm. I say I am perfect, it will also prove me perverse." Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we know that this work of justification by faith is something that changes our affections and our impulses, right? So she says, in order for man to be justified by faith. Faith must reach a point where it will control the affections and impulses of the heart. It is by obedience that faith itself is made perfect. So the people who don't believe in obedience, that Christ just justifies us and we're at peace with God, um, are actually rejecting justification because in order for a man to be justified, justified by faith, Faith must reach a point where it will control the affections. So if we're not controlled, we're not really justified. Um, I'm going to skip some of this here. It's, it's good quotes, but um, um, I just didn't think some of this was where I wanted to go. This is dealing, and, and there's nothing wrong with these things here, but, um, okay. So this is from Christ Object Lessons here. I want to go. Of every Christian, the Lord requires growth in efficiency and capability in every line. Christ has paid us our wages, even his own blood and suffering, to secure our willing service. He came to our world to give us an example of how we should work and what spirit we should bring into our labor. He desires us to study how we can best advance his work and glorify his name in the world, crowning with honor, with the greatest love and devotion, the Father who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So she's talking about how, what it means to work together with God, to be a servant, to be a worker. But Christ has given us no assurance that to attain perfection of character is an easy matter. A noble, all-round character is not inherited. It does not come to us by accident. A noble character is earned by individual effort through the merits and grace of Christ. God gives the talents, the powers of the mind. We form the character. It is formed by hard, stern battles with self. Conflict after conflict must be waged against hereditary tendencies. We shall have to criticize ourselves closely and allow not one unfavorable trait to remain uncorrected. So we can see, even though we are justified when we come to Christ, that as we continue to walk, and we try to develop a Christ-like character, as we develop a Christ-like character, we have to fight these battles. And often people who profess righteousness by faith aren't interested in these battles. So they will say something like, uh, I cannot remedy my defects of character. So she says, let no one say. I cannot remedy my defects of character. And we've heard people say this in many different ways. We may even ourselves at times said something about some aspect of our character that we didn't feel that we could remedy and that somehow we would have that forever. But she says, if you come to this decision, you will certainly fail of obtaining eternal or everlasting life. The impossibility lies in your own will. If you will not, then you cannot overcome. The real difficulty arises from the corruption of an unsanctified heart and an unwillingness 
to submit to the control of God. So we have to believe that God can remedy these defects of character that we have, that we see in ourselves. And we have to continually be in this battle. Now, when Ellen White talks about our own will, she's not talking about will worship, the idea that we can use willpower. What we do is we make a choice. The will makes a choice. Are we going to um, cooperate with God in the work that he wants to do in us or not? God can't make that decision for us. God can't choose for us. He can present truths and opportunities uh, to our mind in our experience, and we have to make the choice. But if we decide ahead of time that it's impossible, that God can't actually change our characters, that's just an excuse. We have an unsanctified heart. And we are unwilling to submit to the control of God, which means we're naturally rebellious. So God has to do a work in us, but he can't do that work in us without us cooperating with him. Okay. Um, so I'm going to skip some of this. That part was important. Um, other parts are important too, but that one related to what we were talking about. So um, when we look at this progression of, of the Christian life, so let's put it this way. Has anybody ever here ever heard anybody say, I will continue sinning till Jesus comes. I can't overcome my sin. You ever heard anyone say that? Maybe not in those exact words, but that's what they're inferring, such as, well, as long as you intend to do good, God looks on your good intentions and says, well, that sounds awfully Catholic to me, you know? Yeah. It's like yeah. by work, by, by, thinking, by thinking positively, Christ will accept me because most of my meritorious works are on the, you know, like their worth is giving me heaven. Uh, I remember hearing that, and that was from from an elder. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, so people will look at the idea that um, we just have to, do, you know, we our intentions are accepted, but because we're sinners, we're always going to fail. That's usually how it's sort of put. We're we're sinners. We have a sinful nature. We're always going to fail, and there will be. Sometimes they'll put this standard of perfection that um, is sort of unrealistic. They'll say all of the things that you could have done differently, you're not, you know, those are sins. So if you could have done righteousness, but you didn't do it, you have some duty that you somehow neglected for some reason. Or if you just even think about sin, uh, then somehow you're a sinner. So they, and if we make a mistake in some way, then that's a sin. And so that shows and we will always be doing that. Um, so what are they doing when they look at sin in that way? What's, what's the problem? I mean, there's the problem that they don't believe in overcoming sin. But what are they doing to, what's the thinking behind that? Many of us have this kind of thinking. Okay, let's put it this way. If you were righteous, would you know it? Anybody want to answer that? You mean, if, do I think that I've attained sinlessness? Definitely not. It's a daily struggle. Okay. So, so we're always, yeah, so we would always see ourselves as sinners, even if we were righteous, correct? 
Um, and right. So, so seeing ourselves, because what people are doing is they're going at righteousness by sight. They're, they're saying, I always see myself fail. So I'm just going to accept the fact that I'm always going to fail. And so I, I will never overcome sin. That's the, that's the sort of position that people take. Um, and, and we're going to see some of these statements. We're, gonna, we're actually going to delve deep into this, this question. How does a, uh, a saved sinner see himself? And they'll see the, themselves the same way Christ saw himself. Now, Christ knew he was righteous by faith. But when he looked at himself, he could see in himself no good thing. The same experience that the 144,000 have. And, and we, we will look into that in detail. So the problem, though, is that people are looking by sight. And, and never does God say or suggest in the scriptures that once we have a perfect character, we're going to be focused upon that, that we will be certain that we are saved because we see ourselves as righteous. But often that's what people try to do to get peace with God. Because if you can make yourself appear righteous to yourself, then you must be righteous before God. But that's not righteousness by faith. That's righteousness by sight. So we're going we're gonna to be examining this in a lot more detail. But let's go on and read some more here. A character formed to the divine likeness is the only treasure that we can take from this world to the next. Those who are under the instruction of Christ in this world will take every divine attainment with them to the heavenly mansions. And in heaven, we are continually to improve. So what does that mean that we're going to continually improve in heaven? Wouldn't we think that once we get in heaven, we're perfect and there's no more room for imp improvement? So what is perfection then? What is a perfection of character? What does it mean? to have a character formed according to the divine likeness? Does it mean that we're absolutely perfect in every sense? And if we're ac absolutely perfect when we're converted or when we you know, or translated or something. Um, how could we improve upon that? So what kind of perfection of character is it that we can have in this life? What does that mean practically? So she says the heavenly, um, so she says how important then is the development of character in this life? So if we can continually improve in heaven, then the development of character in this life is also important, extremely important. The heavenly intelligences will work with the human agent who seeks with determined faith that perfection of character which will reach out to perfection of action. So what does it mean, perfection of character, that will reach out to perfection of action? Does it mean that we have perfection of action if we have a perfection of character? Our perfection of action proves that we have perfection of character, or we're perfecting character. Okay. Faith without work is dead, right? So our actions prove our faith. 
But she says here, perfection of character, what we have to have is a perfection of character, which will reach out to perfection of action. To everyone engaged in this work, Christ says, I am at your right hand to help you. So perfection of action comes in Christ alone. Right. Right. Only and that's what I'm trying to share with a friend because I I keep talking to her about overcoming, like for example, arguing with her husband, like screaming fits, you know. Mm -hmm. Read Adventist Home, read Child Guidance, claim those scriptures. God will give you the power to overcome this. Of course, they have to do it together, but I said, I can't have this. You know, like she was saying, I want you to stay on 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 this property, etc. I said, I can't have this arguing. I can't have this fighting. This is very unchristlike, and this is how you can overcome it. If I can overcome my hideous temper, so can you. Right. So when we have a perf perfection of character, we're not talking about creature perfection, right? That is, we are not perfect in action. We reach out to perfection in action when we have a perfection of character. That is, we reach out for Christ's righteousness and we cooperate with Christ in the work that we do. As the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. Whatever is to be done at his command may be accomplished in his strengths. strength. All his biddings are enablings. So this cooperation with God doesn't mean that we are in and of ourselves perfect, that we have righteousness in and of ourselves, but it means that we have a perfection of character that desires and works with God in cooperation to work out his will, to accomplish his purposes. <clears throat> Um, she says, now this is uh, back to faith and works. It is the righteousness of Christ that makes the penitent sin sinner acceptable to God and works his justification. However sinful has been his life, if he believes in Jesus as his personal savior, he stands before God in the spotless robe of Christ's imputed righteousness. The sinner so recently dead in trespass and sins is quickened by faith in Christ. He sees by faith that Jesus is his Savior and alive forevermore, able to save unto the uttermost all that come unto God by him. In the atonement made for him, the believer sees such breadth and length and height and depth of efficiency, sees such completeness of salvation purchased at such infinite cost that his soul is filled with praise and thanksgiving. He sees as in a glass the glory of the Lord and is changed into the same image as by the Spirit of the Lord. He sees the robe of Christ's righteousness woven in the loom of heaven, wrought by his obedience, Christ's obedience, and imputed to the repenting soul through faith in his name. So Christ does something for us that it is his righteousness alone that is imputed to us. Um, also, his righteousness is imparted to us. But that's the work of sanctification, not the work of justification, even though they're closely tied together. When the sinner has a view of the matchless charms of Jesus, sin no longer looks attractive to him. For he beholds the chiefest among 10,000, the one altogether lovely, he realizes by a personal experience the power of the gospel, whose vastness of design is equaled only by its preciousness of purpose. We have a living Savior. He is not in Joseph's new tomb. He has risen from the dead and has ascended on high as a substitute and surety for every believing soul. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we think about this, when I when I read this statement here, uh, dealing with um, the matchless charms of Christ, a uh, beholding Christ, seeing um, seeing His character, what how is this movement defined? This uh, this experience, we'll put it that way. 
what what word have we used to describe this? Okay, so we talk about the Mara vision. So what is the Mara vision? Is this some uh, advanced sort of uh, step in our salvation? It's the looking glass where we are to compare ourselves with Christ. And yes, it is a step in our salvation. Right. So she says here, she connects this with justification, right? He sees as in a glass the glory of the Lord and is changed into the same image as by the Spirit of the Lord. Right? And we say this is the looking glass vision. But this is something that we, we haven't yet experienced that we have to experience. So the question I have is... Is this not, well, I don't know how to put the question without sort of giving how I think about it. Um, is this something different here than the Mara vision, this uh, statement? I don't think so. Okay. So, but we look at the Mara vision in this movement as something that's going to happen in the future. Do we not? What if the Mara vision is the completion or the end result of sanctification okay so let's 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 look at it this way so i came to christ i saw that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil i recognized that i'd been hiding in the darkness not wanting god to see my sin and that I needed to confess my sin and come to Christ and ask him to take over my life. And to me, that's what I experienced. But when we look at this, this idea of seeing the glory of the Lord, how much light could God give me when I first came to him? Could I truly see the glory of the Lord? No, you die. It, Paul said, "We see now. We see through a glass darkly, but then face to face." Yeah, it's a process. I think the mirage right now for me is a process, definitely. I okay. mean, I perish in the ultimate glory of God. So let's look at Second Corinthians chapter three. Um, this is one of my favorite chapters. I've spent a lot of time studying it. I've shared it with uh, Baptists. Um, in trying to show what the gospel is, because they believe in the once saved, always saved idea, and and I think that you can disprove it um, in a, in a positive way, not in an argumentative way, by going through and understanding Second Corinthians chapter three. So we're going to just quickly uh, go through this, and and we'll probably come at, look at this in more detail uh, tomorrow afternoon at two o'clock. Uh, Mountain Standard Time, Mountain Daylight Time. So anyways, Paul says, do we begin again to commend ourselves or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. And here, uh, Paul is quoting what scripture? Or alluding to, I guess, what scripture? So there's a couple of scriptures that we could look at. One would be Jeremiah 31, 33 that says, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, <coughs> I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. 
and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Any other any other verse that we can think of? So God was also going to give us a heart of flesh. He's going to take the stony heart out, and he's going to give us a heart of flesh. Anybody know where that verse is? Um, yeah, so that's Ezekiel 11, verse 19. Um, and Ezekiel 36, 26, they both basically say the same thing. It's usually Ezekiel 36, 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. So he's using both of these illustrations here. We have this stony heart, and we have a heart of flesh. And he also is going to have this law written in our hearts, but not on tables of stone, but on the fleshy tables of the heart. So we're going to look at what this means. Now, why is he talking about epistles or letters? Anybody know why he's using this illustration here? So this is a in the context of 2 Corinthians. There's lots going on here. Uh, Paul is giving an appeal to the Corinthians. He had been there, be he had written a letter before in 1 Corinthians, and this is 2 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians, wherever it is. Oops. Right, so he's got these two different letters, 1 Corinthians, and then he's going to write to them, and then he has to make this second appeal to them. Anybody know the context of what the problem is with the Corinthian church? In the second epistle, he was also referring back to that there were Judaizers that wanted the converts to continue to keep to the, the more of the feasts of that that had passed away that had become <clears throat> passe really in the death of Christ. Yeah, so yeah, so what they're trying to do, what, what happens is these people are converted, they become Christians, but now you're going to have a, an appeal um, made and i'm just trying to remember all the things here because he's going to talk about this uh ministry of reconciliation so he, he's he's building up to something here um so there's there's lots in here but anyway it, the context is um and you'll see this in some of his other letters as well is how do we know how do, we, how do we experience salvation? How do we know that God is leading us? What's the difference between uh, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant? And he addresses it different ways to different people. But here he's going to talk about the New Covenant. And, and this can be see, clearly seen when you study the book of Hebrews, what he says about the covenants. But here he's talking uh, to many people who are Gentile Christians. And so he's using an illustration uh, that they can understand, but he's he's speaking against these errors that are being brought in. And, and this is basically the same thing that Ellen White is doing in 1888. We have that same problem, that people are looking at the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. Um, so we're going to read through some of this, but we're going to go over it again tomorrow afternoon, So as I said. 
Um, so he's going to use these letters or epistles because that's what he's writing to them about. But he says that we need to be letters. We need to be epistles that people can see uh, that Christ has written his character upon us. We're going to be the epistle of Christ. But it's ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tables of stone, but on the fleshy tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. So we're looking to God, our righteousness, everything that we we are doing for God comes from God himself. It's not something that we have manufactured in ourselves. He says, who also hath made us able ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the spirit be rather glorious? So the Israelites, when Moses came down from the mount and they saw his face glowing, they couldn't endure this light. But the ministration of the spirit is even more glorious. That is, what it reveals of Christ, of God's character, is even greater than what was revealed on Moses' face when he came down from receiving the Ten Commandments. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Now, when he talks about the ministration of condemnation, and we'll see this, we know that the law written and engraven on stones, why, why is it a ministry of condemnation? What's the problem with the law written and engraven on stones? There's nothing wrong with the law, right? But what's the problem with it? Well, points out sin, but it doesn't give us uh, the knowledge of how to overcome it. Right. So it can show us that we are a sinner, but it doesn't have in it, in it any power to actually save us if it's written on stone alone. Right. So it has to be written upon our heart, the fleshy tables of the heart. So we know that the letter of the law, that is law, the law written and engraven on stones, can show that we're a sinner. But the law, it's in and of itself, can't give us righteousness. It can't forgive us because that's not the purpose of the law. We need God's grace. So often what people will do is they look at this verse, well, the letter of the law, that's the Ten Commandments. It's just the ministry of death. And we need the new covenant. And the new covenant is God's grace. But we know according to this, it's going to be written upon the fleshy tables of the heart. It's the same law, as we will see. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For if that which was done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is, is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. So Paul is being here very plain in his speech. But then he says, but not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away, in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon the heart, their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. 
Now, the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So we're going to look at this tomorrow afternoon because uh, it's 830 and I want to end on time. We'll go back and look at the statement in the spirit of prophecy. and We'll examine this, this, the rest of this uh, chapter in a little more detail and, and also some other verses that relate to this. Um, so the idea then of the mare vision, that looking glass vision, we will see how it relates to this statement. Beholding as in the glass, the glory of the Lord. And, and how it relates to this movement. How it relates to the lines. That's what we're going to try, try to do. Make it as clear as we can. And any final comments before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the Sabbath, for the rest that we can have in Christ, that we can set aside our works, our labors, and that we can enter into your rest. Help us to understand these things as this Sabbath we Open your word in the morning and in the afternoon as we seek um, your presence. Help us to see your glory and to see our great need of you and the power that you promise to overcome our sins. We give our hearts to you, Lord. We ask that you can work through us and in us. And be with each person, those watching these videos. Um, and those participating, may we come to truly know you, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.